Great, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would just like to add that um, my training is in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, but I'm also a neuronutritionist. So you may not know what that means yet, but we'll talk about it in a moment. So today I'm here to talk about the future of aging, and specifically about the future of brain aging. So why and how the brain ages, and how to change that or make it better in the 21st century. So I'm going to start out with some good news about aging. We live longer. It is not uncommon nowadays to live up to age 75, 80, or older. And um, so that's really good news for us. And as more and more people get older, scientists are clear that an older society is here to stay. The not so good news is that living longer does not mean living healthier. Increased life expectancy does not necessarily correlate with increased quality of life. But in fact, it really brings about higher risk for age-related brain disease, like Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia. Personally, I've been working in the Alzheimer's field for over 15 years, and I can tell you it's a horrible disease that causes deficits in memory, in judgment, in language, in thinking, in reasoning, and also in activities of daily living, and eventually leads to hospitalization and loss of function. So right now in the medical field, we have a challenge. We're facing an Alzheimer's disease epidemic. Of all the challenges to aging in this century, in our lifetime, nothing compares to the unprecedented scale of Alzheimer's. We and others have estimated that by the year 2050, more than 13 million people will have Alzheimer's disease in the United States alone. And the similar trend has been looked at and observed in Europe and every other industrialized country. And just to give you a sense of what that really means, like 13 million people is like the entire populations of Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York put together. And that's a lot of people. We also have more bad news. We have no treatment for Alzheimer's disease at this point. We have some drugs that are called symptomatic drugs, which means that they address the symptoms of disease, but they don't cure it. And they, they only work for a short amount of time, and they come with a lot of side effects. So we have also some drugs that are disease-modifying drugs that should work like vaccines for Alzheimer's. They're in the pipeline, but even pharmaceutical companies do not know if they're going to be ready in the next 10 years or so. So this really begs the question, are drugs the only goal? Could there be an equally effective solution to this problem? Or more specifically, do we need to get sick and then take medicines? Or is there something that we can do to prevent that in the first place and just not get sick? So if you will, the breaking news is that Alzheimer's might be, in part, preventable. And the, really, the, the best bet that we have is to strike before the disease takes place. So at this point, we have no silver bullet to predict who is going to get Alzheimer's disease. But we have many new tools and technologies that allow us to identify people at risk. And this is really what my lab and many other labs in the world are doing right now. We're looking for risk. There are two technologies that have really changed the way that we look at brain aging at this point. We have cheap, cheap genomics on one hand that allows us to understand genetic predisposition in the individual, but also we have brain imaging, like that's, a, that's an MRI scan moving up and down. This is what I do, I do brain imaging. That allows us to understand brain function, brain structure, brain biochemistry over time, but more importantly, before disease. Before people get sick, we can already see changes in the brain that are predictive of Alzheimer's disease. And these studies have shown that Alzheimer's is not a disease of old age, but instead, it begins many years before symptoms occur. And in particular, the brain process that leads to dementia unfolds over a 20, 40 year period prior to anybody losing their keys or forgetting something. And what's really important is that there are many genetic, lifestyle, and environmental factors that damage the brain when people are still young, somewhere, for some people as early as at birth. So the good news about this, if you will, is that a lengthy onset of symptoms really means that we have a lot of time to implement prevention strategies. We have about 60 years before people really start losing their memories where we really can intervene and make sure that nobody gets sick. That's the goal in the Alzheimer's field right now. In order to do that, we need to focus on risk for Alzheimer's and all the risk factors that we know increase risk for dementia. There are three major risk factors. There are three major types of risks at this point. 
We have risks that cannot be modified. And these are your genetics. This is your DNA that you were born with. And what most people I find don't know is that Alzheimer's, um, only less than 1% of the total Alzheimer's cases are due to, to genes, really, to genetic mutations that make you get sick when you're very early, in your 30s or 40s. More, many more people have a family history. They may have risk genes, but they don't make you sick. They just increase your risk of dementia as compared to people who don't have a family history or who do not carry those genes. Then we have risks that can be modified. These are medical illnesses that affect the brain, like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, toxin exposures, infections, any metabolic problems that affect the brain and make you more vulnerable to developing diseases as you age. And finally, we have risks that can not only can be modified, but they can also totally be eliminated. And this is lifestyle. In my field, people are reluctant to, to really appreciate how much lifestyle is important for your brain. It took about a century of medical research to, to get to the point where pretty much everybody agrees the risk of dementia is increased by lack of exercise, by smoking, too much alcohol, some drugs, lack of social interactions, but mostly, possibly, most of all, a poor diet. So the way you eat is really important for you. And if these numbers actually hold on and hold true, we can tell that of the future 13 million people with Alzheimer's disease, only 1%, so about 130,000 people, will get sick because of genetic mutations. And there's not much that we can do for them at this point. But another 4 million people, more or less, who carry some, some risk genes are able, should be able to mitigate risk by living, by, by living a really healthy lifestyle. But the really important message here is that about 70% of all Alzheimer's cases are just not accounted for by genetic mutations, but they might really be related to lifestyle. And that's 9 million people who don't need to get sick at all. And this is the goal of many people. And also, one thing that's really important and is becoming more and more recognized is that genes throw the gun, but lifestyle really pulls the trigger. So from a brain aging perspective, lifestyle means in large part food. We are what we eat, and the nutrients from food determine the composition of our cell membranes, including our, cell, our brain cell membranes, bone marrow, blood hormones, all the tissues in the body. So food is really the foundation upon which our body, but also our brain, are built. What is interesting is that in 2016, we still associate diets with the way we look. But food really changes our brain and the way we think. So instead of just counting calories and checking our weight in the morning, we also need to, to really answer this question, which diet will allow us to keep our minds alive and alert as we age and protect us against disease? When I started to look into that, I found that there was a lot of conflicting information for the patients, really, about what's good or what is bad also for your brain. Depending on which book you read, you can, you know, some people tell you grains are terrible for you. Some other people will tell you that meat is the devil. You should never eat meat. You should go vegan. So there's a lot of conflicting information, and the way we address this question is to really look at the brain, to test it with brain imaging and other biomarkers, other uh, markers of disease. And we start by understanding that the brain is built on food. So the brain is the most delicate organ of the body. It's made of fat by almost 50%. But at the same time, it's the most metabolically active. It takes up almost 25% of all the food that you put in your body. It's immediately used by the brain to, to make energy. So this is a terrible combination. Fat and very high energy activity it makes you rusty really easily. So the brain relies on food for energy, for nourishment, for functionality. And we need to constantly supply dietary nutrients to the bloodstream for the brain to work. So I'm going to make it a lot clearer when we look at the way the brain cells or neurons communicate with each other. The way they do it is then uh, they use neurotransmitters, where neurotransmitters are just chemicals that just basically kind of jump from one neuron to the next, carrying information forward. There are many neurotransmitters in each brain. We have about 80 per brain. And today, we're going to look at these two, acetylcholine and serotonin. They're really, really strongly involved with memory, with learning, with plasticity, and also with sleep and with mood. If you've ever been sleep deprived, you know that your memory just goes astray really easily. 
So starting with the first one, just don't, don't worry about the names. The, the important thing is that this neurotransmitter, this brain chemical, is made of a B vitamin that is called choline. Choline is not produced by the brain. 10% is made by the liver. Everything else comes from the foods we eat. And we need to eat a certain amount every day just to be healthy. This is just a general medical recommendation. If you're a woman, you need about 425 milligrams a day. If you're a man, you need a little bit more. You might think, well, these are milligrams. That's easy. It's not easy. So we have choices. We can eat one and a half kilos of broccoli every day. Good luck with that. Or we can drink three liters of milk, or eat half a kilo of chicken, or three eggs, or two tablespoons of soy lecithin. I would go for the soy lecithin. But the same is true for serotonin. This is also the happiness neurotransmitter. If you don't have enough of this neurotransmitter, you may develop depression. This chemical derives from an amino acid that is a part of a protein, just a protein, like the ones that, that we from the foods we eat. And again, we need about 400 milligrams a day. Not easy. You, well, this is kind of easy. You can eat half a kilo of dark chocolate every day, or a kilo of milk chocolate, if you prefer milk, or 175 prunes, of course, or 150 grams of turkey, or just a bite of tuna fish, sashimi style, or three tablespoons of peanut butter. So this is not to say you need to eat three pounds of broccoli or 300 prunes. This is more to make the point that eating right for your brain is not easy. We're lacking the education, if you will, or the instinct at this point to really eat the foods that are best for our brains. We just don't know which foods these are. These are not intuitive. And it's very complex to eat right for your brain. But it's incredibly important to do that because not only we are what we eat, we will be what we have eaten, which is a complicated way to say that our brain fitness aging is the outcome of all the choices that each and every one of us has made for a healthy brain or not. And this is true from a genetic standpoint, because there's more and more understanding that food is information. Food is not just food. It really changes your body through an action on the, on the DNA. There's a field that's called epigenetics that's really important right now that says, um, that really shows how food can turn some genes off. So the right foods can really turn off the genes that make you sick. Whereas the wrong foods can turn on those genes and turn off the genes that make you healthy and lively. So it's really important to eat right for your brain because food changes the way your DNA works. And also what's becoming apparent is that no two people are alike, no two brains are alike, and everybody has very specific nutritional needs, which is a little bit hard to, to tap into. But this is what we do uh, at the lab, and this is also what, what I do in private practice, which is looking at individual genetics, nutrition, lifestyle, cognitive ability, and brain function over time. So we do genetic assessments, but mostly we look at the brain. And we, we collect blood work and journaling to look at nutrients. And we also look at the brains of these people. This is a PET scan, which is what I do preferentially. It's called positron emission tomography. And can show how the brain changes over time and in response to whatever foods we put in our bodies. So the question is really, which foods and which nutrients promote healthy brain aging and may help us fend off dementia as we age? So we and others have found that there are many, many nutrients that really help and they really support healthy brain aging. So just to summarize these, these fairly complicated chemical names, there are some fats that are really good for you, like omega-3s that you find in salmon or in walnuts, the monosaturated fats that you can get from olive oil, bunch of vitamins, B vitamins are really good for you, as are vitamin C and vitamin E, which are antioxidants, so fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. There are some phytonutrients, which means nutrients from plants, like carotenoids, which means it's kind of code for orange fruits and orange ve vegetables. There are minerals and salts, like selenium, copper, and zinc, that you can get from nuts and seeds. And also, water is really important. Always keep your brain hydrated. It seems to, to really help with cognitive function. There are also nutrients that are not so good for your brain and that are associated with increased risk for dementia. These are transaturated fats, saturated fats and cholesterol, which also means fast foods, processed foods, lots of animal foods and meat. Minerals, so a little bit of the, of the minerals are good for you, and we saw that in the previous slide, 
but too much of a good thing can, can actually be toxic for your brain. And if you have too much sodium, ion, copper, zinc, it really damages your brain. It makes it rusty. You don't want your brain to, to go rusty for sure. So in order to put that in a, in a more practical context, like what do I eat? There are many dietary patterns that have been associated with better brain aging, a lower risk of dementia. They really incorporate most of the good nutrients that we see, that we saw in the previous line, and they also have very little of the bad nutrients for your brain. And the number one dietary pattern is the Mediterranean diet, like people eat in Italy, in Greece. I'm Italian, so I don't know. Uh, people on the Mediterranean diet have lower risk of dementia, lower risk of stroke, decreased brain atrophy, which means their brains don't age as fast as people who are not on this diet. They show increased brain activity on the brain scans that I showed you, but they also have lower Alzheimer's disease pathology prior to developing dementia, so they age better. The their risk for Alzheimer's is somehow reduced. And just to really show you more clearly, these are brain scans of our patients. This is a, this is a brain. This is an MRI scan of the brain of a 52-year-old woman who is perfectly cognitively normal, clinically and cognitively normal. Um, I wish I could point. So there's little things in the middle of the brain are called ventricles. Um, it looks like two, little, yeah, like two little dashes. And you want them to be really, really small because they contain water. And the more water you have in your brain, the less tissue you have in your brain, whereas you want to have all the possible tissue that you can get. And also, the brain is really, whoa, sorry, is really close to the bones, to the skull. And that's a really good thing as people age. So by comparison, this is another patient who is instead 50 years old. So she's slightly younger. You can see that, yeah. She's also cognitively normal. She's doing totally fine. But she's been eating an American diet all her life. So lots of processed foods, fast foods, not much exercise. Her brain is not, doesn't look so good. This is not what you want your brain to look at to look like when you're 50. So that part inside the brain is much larger. There's a lot more dark. There's a lot more water in the brain. And also, all the way around the brain, there's a lot more dark. It means the brain is atrophizing. It's getting smaller. And she's losing neurons. She's losing brain cells. So the final little arrow points to um, the hippocampus. It's the memory center of the brain. You want it to be as big and chubby as you, as you possibly can get. But in her case, it's actually a little bit smaller and it's getting darker. So to summarize, the future of food is the future of brain aging, maybe. Or in other words, the future of brain aging is related to the future of food. At an individual level and the regulatory level, food will determine how we age. Alzheimer's and memory loss might be preventable by making the right choices. And so we really need to pick diets that optimize for brain nutrients to start structuring recommendations for neuronutrition, nutrition for the brain. We also really need personalized medicine and that really has shown that the key technological and scientific breakthroughs in brain aging may not have yielded vaccines or pills yet, but they definitely gave us the individual ability to take care of our own future. So take care of your brains, and thank you so much for your time. Woo. <laughs>